Brian, welcome to Online Race Industry Week. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here with everybody. It's great to have you here. I, I, I'm going to give a, a bit of an introduction here. So just, just give me a few minutes. Um, I wanted to have as a subject for the Online Race Industry Week, the idea of how to develop a successful race team. And I, I kind of mentioned it before, but basically the job of a team owner or team manager is a, stretches across all segments of racing. So whether you have a sprint car, a stock car, racing at your local track, it's a hard job. So I, I want to tackle this subject and I wanted to tackle the subject with Brian Herta. So uh, he was the first person that I thought of. He was the guy I wanted. And actually, Brian was the first person we contacted to get as a potential speaker for Online uh, Race Industry Week. And we said, the racing shows are closed this year. We feel like we should still get together this time of year and talk and share. And, and Brian said, you can count on me. So we're very fortunate to have Brian Herta here. And uh, his history, two wins as a, a driver in the kart series. Brian Hurd of Autosport, founded in 2009, has grown from a single car Indy Lights team into a uh, multiple uh, two-time Indy 500 winning team, as well as multiple sports car championships. Brian Hurd of Autosport has won races in every discipline they've entered, including Indy Lights, IndyCar, Global Rallycross, Pirelli World Challenge, and, and IMSA. So uh, the Brian Hurd of Auto racing, uh, auto sport rose to prominence after winning the 2011 Indianapolis 500 with driver Dan Weldon. And then five years later, uh, the, the team partnered with Andretti Autosport and defied the odds again, uh, winning their second Indianapolis 500 with the rookie driver, Alexander Rossi. So again, to repeat that, we're talking to a team owner that won the Indy 500 with a rookie driver. And of course, I should mention that, uh, by the way, he's the father of Colton Herta, one of the best young race car drivers in the United States. And I've kind of watched Brian operate from sort of an under the radar viewpoint. And it just seems to me that Brian has been on a steady march to the top of the pyramid as a team owner. He has a long runway in front of him and a lot more to accomplish. And as I say this, I want to also acknowledge all the pressures on a team owner in very different directions. So pressures on Brian, we had Roger Penske, he knows what these pressures are. So the same person has to be responsible for getting sponsorship sold. The same person has to get the best drivers. Not the most famous, not the ones bringing the most money, not the ones who talk big, not the ones who wreck the equipment, the best. And that's a whole very tricky subject on its own. The team owner has to get the right engine man. The team owner has to get the right suspension guy, maybe an aero guy, has to get the right technical guy so you're race ready every single time. Has to pick the team up off the floor because of a heartbreaking finish. And then has the team get the team back to focusing on next week's race after a, a glorious win. And then after all that, he has to not go broke in the process. So um, to me, Brian Hurd is one of the smartest, savviest people uh, in United States racing, probably worldwide. And uh, I've kind of watched Brian Hurd's team through a really great young driver named Michael Lewis. So uh, I've been watching Michael Lewis's career since he was in quarter midgets. And I, I love Michael as a driver. He just seems like approaches lap times and, and practice laps like a scientist or engineer. He just methodically carves away the seconds as he, he figures out the track. And he's dedicated to winning 24 seven, 365 days out of the year. And then at the end of the race, Michael's always racing for the win. So he's not out there for a Sunday drive. At the end of the race, Michael Lewis will put the car someplace. It's never been before if that's what it takes to win the race. So I've always loved Michael as the driver. And then he gets connected with Brian Herta. And lo and behold, the 2018 Pirelli World Challenge, uh, Brian Herta's autosport team earns the team's championship that year. Hyundai earned the manufacturer's championship. And Michael Lewis and his teammate, Mark Wilkins, I think they came in P2 in the driver's championship. But then the next year, uh, 2019, uh, let me see, get this straight. Yeah, they, they won the Drivers' Championship. So Michael and uh, Mark Wilkins won the Drivers' Championship, the Team Championship in the IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge TCR class. And, and, and this year, 2020 IMSA Michelin Pilot Champions TCR class, Gabby Chavez and Ryan Norman uh, won the championship. But Brian Hurd Osport finished one, two, three in that championship. And I'm just not sure everybody knows about the Honda program. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. Also, it's really cool that Brian Herda is connected with Kerr Bagajanian. 
which has a storied history, those two guys in racing, especially out on the West Coast. Just great names. And Carrie, of course, is from the family that operated Ascot. Uh, Carrie's a real leader, mover and shaker in our sport. So Brian's just connected all these different ways. I'm just always curious what's Brian Hurd are going to do next. So before we get to the indie stuff, and I'm, I'm just almost finished, I have this quote from your blog, Brian, on the Brian Hurd Autosport website. And I'm really curious to hear what's all behind it. Because I think there's insight here on what it takes to be a successful team owner. So here's the quote. A big priority of ours in 2020 was actively engaging the large community of Veloster owners we so often hear from on our social channels. Now that's really stepping away from parts that you need to win a race. It's the idea of building community, cementing community on the part of the, uh, the, the car owner or the car mark. What's behind that thinking, Brian? I just thought it was brilliant. Well, really, it's understanding uh, understanding our needs of our partner at Hyundai. Uh, they're not a brand that's historically been owned in motors in the motorsport world. They've they've dallied a little bit. Uh, they've they've built a winning reputation in Europe with their WRC Rally program, and uh, they built these cars a few years ago to race in the TCR class in the World Touring Car Championship. And I approached them and said, look, we've got a team. We were competing in the Global Rallycross Championship at that time, but that seemed to be winding down. And we said, look, we're looking for a project. And they said, look, we are building these TCR cars. We like to campaign them in the US. We wanna build a motorsport uh, heritage. We wanna build a performance heritage around the end performance line uh, that doesn't exist in Hyundai. And we wanna build a culture around that. So." You know, it's starting to reach out as we we built a little bit of a winning history now with them and reaching out awesome. to these uh, these different clubs, uh, Veloster clubs, things in the areas and starting to engage with them and, and bring them into what we do and building a community around Hyundai and around N is a big part of what they want. So that that's, uh, you know, the winning the races part has to happen first. But once you start doing that, right, how do you sell cars? And that's by engaging in Hyundai enthusiasts and building that uh, that culture in the same way, you know, Corvette's got such a great history and they're a great uh, example for us in uh, in IMSA and how they've built uh, a real uh, cult of, of followers around their IMSA program and winning and Corvette already had such a great performance name. Uh, you know, we, we take a lot of inspiration from what they do and trying to not just recreate it, but even expand on that theme or concept. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. I, uh, sometimes I think uh, team owners who aren't very good or they're just starting out, they, they, they walk into meetings like that and we just want your money. We just want this. We just want that. And really it should be turned around. Here's what we can deliver. Here's what we can bring to you. And the idea of bringing something as complicated as we will help you build a culture around your brand is really pretty amazing. When you have that meeting with Hyundai and you want to bring them over to your side, what are you armed with? Like, do you go with a PowerPoint presentation or, I mean, how does that work? Yes, you do all those things. You, you build the PowerPoints, you, you create uh, a justification for the program. But ultimately, you know, for me, I like to sit at the table, look across, you know, look them in the eye yeah. and say, we're here to win races. You know, our team has won races in every series, every championship it's competed in. And that's why we're here. And that's what we can do for you. And if we can accomplish that, there's a lot of other things we can do on the back of it. Just to compete isn't enough, right? Just to compete, yeah. just to be out there. Um, that doesn't inspire, right? You have to win. You have to show something beyond that to inspire and, and really give people a reason to want to become part of a tribe or a nation. You know, I love that, that nomenclature of a tribe that you mentioned earlier, because I, I, I think it's real and you have to build a winning heritage around it. And, and you know, the, the opening speaker you had, Roger Penske, nobody's done it better than him. Roger is synonymous with winning and that pervades everything he does in business, but it, it, it comes out of what he does on the racetrack. And so again, yeah, I take a lot of inspiration from people like that in motorsport and, and try and uh, recreate it, 
but also maybe put a little bit of our own different spin on it or, or make it unique to ourselves. And then how have you seen Hyundai take advantage of Brian Hurd Autosport in terms of their, their marketing program? Uh, are the drivers going to events? Are you seeing your cars in Hyundai commercials or how, how, how's that happen? Um, largely all of the above. You know, Hyundai has been a great partner to us in that uh, they don't have a lot of motorsports activities yet. Unlike a lot of these brands that have, you know, on any given weekend, they've got cars running in multiple championships all over the country. And with Hyundai, they're still newer in racing. And so while they're growing and building, and there's a lot more Hyundai's racing today than there were three years ago when we started this, uh, it's still it's still growing. So we get a lot of the lion's share of their attention in terms of motorsports. So participating in auto shows, unveilings, car launches, all those things. Uh, you know, you mentioned Michael Lewis. We did an online uh, walk around of a new model that was just that's just been coming out, uh, the new Elantra N line, uh, and we did it. Everything's going online right now because of, of the COVID thing. So we spent no. a, day, a full day in a studio doing an online. Uh, Facebook, and then an Instagram uh, walk around and, and just unveiling the car. And the fact that they included us as the race team in that, where N-Line is their performance, their mid-level performance line, uh, it, it creates a justification on both sides. And it's, it's great that they utilize us in so many uh, meaningful ways in, in all of their marketing activities and not just, you know, we don't just check a box in motorsport. We you know, we try and be a justifier for performance for Hyundai. I'd have to think they, they must be happy with, with what's going on working with you. Do they tell you that or what's going on? Yeah, they've been, they've been very enthusiastic. I mean, we just come off of a, a really dynamite year where we won seven of 10 races in the IMSA championship, you know, took the top three spots in the championship, won the manufacturer's championship, the team title, the driver's title. So, you know, this was sort of a banner year for us. And in such a kind of odd year with COVID and, and all the ways we had to go racing, but, you know, the fact that we were able to maybe deliver them a little bit of, of sunshine in, in what was a pretty rough year for all of us, I think was very much appreciated, very well received, and, and we're very grateful for the partnership we have for them at a time when, you know, a lot of people stepped back from motorsports and, and Hyundai really leaned in. You know, congratulations, Brian. And then uh, that series, we're going to have John Doonan with IMSA. He'll be part of Online Race Industry Week. Um, the series seems like really a fun place to go racing. What do you think about the series? IMSA's got a great championship. I feel very fortunate to be part of two of the three major sanctioning championships uh, in the country between IndyCar and, and IMSA. Um, NASCAR, obviously that's, that's a little outside my wheelhouse, although never say never, but, uh, you know, to be able to compete in both of those series and, you know, the, the IMSA championship has such a great heritage in sports car racing and endurance racing and all that, all that kind of encapsulates that and be able to be part of great events like the 12 hours of Sebring weekends, the, the 24 hours of Daytona. And even though we're in the Michelin pilot challenge, we're able to leverage off of the backs of those great events and, and really take advantage of Hyundai being a meaningful part of the IMSA paddock. Very good. And then for uh, all the people watching, I, I think probably I'll ask the big question. Uh, so you've got quite a record in winning big races and championships, uh, two Indy 500s, unbelievable. Uh, so you've been asked this before, I'm sure. When they ask you, what's the secret? What do you say? It's the people. I always say it's the people, you know, if I've done anything right or learned anything in my 30 plus years in motorsport, it's that you, you align yourself with great people. And, and in every instance you mentioned, that's been true. In 2011, when we won the Indy 500 with Dan Weldon, uh, we did it in partnership. Uh, we aligned ourselves with uh, Sam Schmidt's team and Rob, Rob Edwards, who was a team manager now, was a big part of that success. He's now the team manager at Andretti Autosports. I work very closely with Rob still. So, you know, those type of relationships, then when we partnered with Andretti in 2016, that yielded the win at the 500 with Alexander Rossi. You know, I always say it takes three things in motorsports and really only three things, time, money, and people. And if you have those three things, you can achieve success. 
And the people is the most important thing. If you have good people and you give them enough time and enough money, they find ways to win. Uh, and, and the time and money part's interesting because those two are inversely, inversely related. The more time you have, you can do it with a little less money. The less time you have, you need more money. Uh, neither one of those things can be zero. You can't do it with no time and you can't do it with no money. But if you have those two elements and you provide those to great people, then great things happen. So you know, I appreciate the accolades and, and I'm lucky to have been part of a lot of success in motorsport and, and hungry to hopefully continue to be a part of a lot of success. But I also want to be careful not to take credit uh, for those successes and, and more just try and share the credit or, or defer the credit uh, to the people that really work day in and day out to help achieve those things. Yeah, I, I've been, I felt really blessed to have gotten into the racing industry because of the people and, and I find them to be a special bunch. What, what's your take on, on people in racing? Uh, you know, you've had a lifetime with these people, you're with them in the pits every weekend. Uh, you, you, you must like them. I like most of them. Not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like some more than others. How's yeah. that? Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, racers are a unique and different breed. And, you know, I think for, to a large extent, they're built differently. The, you know, what it, this isn't a job you can do just for the money. Uh, you know, the old adage is very true is, you know, if you want to make a large, you know, if you want to make a small fortune racing, start with a large one. It's very easy to, it's very easy to do that. So to try and really create and run a business in this world, something that has to be self-sustaining, I don't have the ability to, you know, spend millions of dollars out of my own pocket every year to, to, to prop something like a racing program up. It has to be self-sustaining. That's a great challenge. And, and that's a challenge that's true for racers in every single discipline, whether it's, you know, sprint car driver and team, you know, all the way up to IndyCar, NASCAR, NHRA, uh, anything in IMSA having to sort of fulfill your, your desire, your passion for this sport, but then create a business around it is, is a great challenge. And, and the folks who've been able to do that over a sustained period of time, I have a lot of time for, and I have a lot of uh, respect for, because it's, it's a very difficult thing. No, I, I agree. To me, it's hard to win a race. It's almost impossible to win a championship at the local track. I mean, everywhere. And, and then to win multiple championships is, I mean, good luck. That, that's a tough one. And then I wanted to ask uh, about the concept of culture at Brian Herda Autosport. Um, I, I don't know if, do you think in terms of, of culture uh, for the team, is there a culture there that you talk about and you can identify or, or it just kind of happens? Uh, it doesn't, absolutely doesn't just happen. Uh, it's critical. I think every team has its own identity and, especially uh, any team that achieves level of success. And I draw a lot from my experience as a driver in the past. I mean, keep in mind, you know, some of your panelists, I never got to drive for Roger Penske, but Chip Ganassi, Bobby Rahal, guys like this, I, I was able to drive for and, and have great programs and, and Michael Andretti. So I was able to kind of learn from the inside of how these great teams function. And every single program has strengths and weaknesses. Uh, but they all have one thing in common is they have a central leadership figure who sets great expectations and, and then gives those people the tools to go and achieve those expectations. And so if, if there's a single sort of theme is the culture is around winning, right? We're not just there to go out, put cars on the racetrack. Uh, we're there to go and try and compete and go and try and win. And that's a, it's a very different mentality and it's, it's easy to say but then to create a culture where people feel empowered to do their job, to give them the tools, to give them the resource, and then to give them the freedom. Uh, it doesn't do me a lot of good to hire a really smart engineer, but then prevent him from doing the things that he thinks uh, he can do to help us win races. So it's, it's really the culture is, okay, I'm empowering you to go win, but I'm also creating that expectation. And if you don't, you're going to have to have a good reason why, or yeah. I'm going to have to have a reason why I'm going to go find somebody else who can go do that. So, uh, you know, that's, that's part of it. And then trying to create harmony amongst the group. Everybody has ways of working and, and trying to uh, create harmony within the team, but it's the simple things. It's the silliest little things I found 
that are important in, in keeping morale and things, you know, feeding the team lunch on time at the track is a big deal. Uh, you know, getting to stay in hotels that are clean and safe and nice. Uh, you know, some of the, some of those little things that uh, they don't seem like a big deal become major irritants very quickly. So just, just giving the people a good working environment. And I found these guys will work day and night uh, in, without complaint if you're just looking after them in a, in a meaningful way. That's, that's very well said. I, this, this isn't a business of clock watchers. Clock watchers don't do very well. And, and, and you really have to achieve and, and get there. And it, it's a way that happens in the racing business. It doesn't always happen in uh, other industries. I, I've worked uh, for many years, 26 years with Steve Lewis. And uh, Steve did a little thing that was really important. He said, thank you. He said, thank you all the time. And, and when I started with Steve, it's like, well, that's nice. He said, thank you. And then the next week he said, thank you. And the next week, and you know, I was working really hard. I was doing good things. And the idea of what you just said about the little things matter, uh, nobody ever said thank you to me before Steve Lewis. So I, I think you're onto something. And I picture you as being an accessible team owner uh, with your team, with the guys. Is that true? Can they all come talk to Brian or and you're out there and available or how's that work? The communication channel. Right. Try to try to be accessible. Um, you know, our situation is a little unique. I live in California. Team is based in Speedway, Indiana. I, I've normally spent a lot more time with them this year because of COVID and everything. Yeah. You know, I haven't traveled as much. I haven't been with them in the shop as much as I normally would be. So it's created some challenges. And as we grow, we're, we're, we're at sort of an in, interesting inflection point as a team is the IMSA team, which started life as the Red Bull Global Rallycross team, was a small self-contained unit. It's separate from the IndyCar program. Uh, the IndyCar program is fully lives and runs at Andretti Autosport. So the IMSA program with Hyundai is, is separate and started off as a very small, dedicated group of people, but it continues to grow. And we're at that point where we're really transitioning from a small team to a bigger team. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a larger staff, uh, you know, having to meet HR challenges, uh, 401k programs, uh, medical plans for, for employees, all the things that big teams and big businesses need to do. We're transitioning into those right now. And as my focus has to be more on some of the business side of those things, it does take me a little bit more out of the day to day side. Uh, which is which is something I'm still learning and trying to adapt to and, and try to figure out how do we keep all the things that were great about us as a small team uh, while we're growing into a big team. And, you know, the, we should have this in another three years or four years, and hopefully I'll be able to talk about that a little more. But those are the things that we're trying to learn and, and I'm trying to adapt to. And, and as we're, those are our biggest challenges uh, with our team now is, is we're really not a small team anymore. So we can't think like one. And there's great advantage with being small. You're very nimble, you're very adaptive. You have uh, a very small group of people, communication's easy. Uh, as you get bigger, those things get harder and you can, you can bog yourself down in them. Uh, so navigating all those things is really interesting. But again, I've got great mentors and I've got great examples with you know, Rob Edwards and the folks at Andretti Autosport, uh, the experiences I've had with these other great teams, Ray Hall, Ganassi, so uh, I rely on a lot of those things uh, as we try and chart a path towards being one of those teams. Yeah, you know, the, working on the 401k program and the medical program and all that, it's just tedious, frustrating stuff. It has nothing to do with horsepower or aerodynamics or anything. But uh, I agree, if, if you can get that squared away, uh, it, it means a lot to the, the people on the team. I'm trying to hire good people again to do those things because it's right. That's not where my passion lies. All right? I, I want to spend every minute of every day trying to figure out how to make race cars go faster. That's the part I care about. And that's the part I love. Uh, but also recognizing that that's not the only important part if we're going to grow our business. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've loved working for uh, smaller businesses. And then as soon as somebody hires a human resources manager, I get worried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. Um, and I'll go through some other questions. You seem to have a magic way with drivers and, and selecting drivers and magic's probably not the right word because you probably let a, 
a lot of work and effort into it. But what do you look for in, in drivers and selecting drivers? Uh, look for winners, closers, you know, guys who can get it done. And really that's, that's the main element. You know, there's, there's marketing concessions. There's, you know, all those things are important, but really what we need are drivers who can go win races. And I've been fortunate to have worked with a lot of winners. You know, we've talked a lot about when we won the 2011 uh, 500 with Dan Weldon and we were, you know, we were a single car team. I think it had been the sixties, the last time a non full season championship team won the Indy 500. So it had been like 50 years and on paper, we really didn't have a realistic shot or a great reason to believe we could win that race, but it was really Dan that showed up every single day and told the guys and told us, you know, we're going to win the race. Not, not like, Hey, we hope we're going to win or we're, you know, we're going to do our best. He told us we were going to win and he believed it so strongly and his, his belief in us and himself was so strong that it elevated the whole team. And that was a real eye opener for me. And that was probably the number one thing I learned from Dan that I try and carry to this day is he created this expectation within the team and the team rose to it. Uh, and so I, I, he taught me that it's probably the single biggest lesson I've learned in racing. And the the thing I try and carry forward, you know, in everything we do in racing is creating that expectation of we're going to win. I don't even know how, right. I, we're going to figure it out, but we're here to do one thing and that's to win this race or win this championship. And uh, it it was such a powerful uh, fundamental thing that I didn't fully understand as a driver when I was competing. I wish I did uh, because I think it would have made me a much better driver, but I've learned it now. Uh, and I think it's, it served me and our team very, very well. And that's why I always say Dan is sort of a cornerstone of our team because he, we won some races in Indy lights and some things before him, but that became a pivotal moment. We won something that mattered, something of note, uh, and he taught us how to do it. And so if, if anything that I can carry forward, it's that is he taught us how to win. And we always have to remember that lesson. Yeah, that speech just gave me chills. And uh, that's worth online racing this week, just to hear you articulate that, Brian. So th- thank you very much. And I- I've seen people like Dan and, and like yourself, and it just seemed The wife seized up here. Uh, and people like Dan, they just seem to will it and, and, and make it happen. Uh, well, he, he does. <clears throat> he did. And, um, you know, I, 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 get a, I, I get a little emotional when I talk about it still. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't think I'm here today without Dan and what he did for us. Uh, I don't think our team exists today without that. Um, but I'm, I'm proud of where we've grown from there. Right. And, and I'm proud of what we've been able to do. And the fact that, you know, you've asked me to be on a panel here or, or talk about this at all uh, is incredibly a humbling experience for me to, you know, to see the other great panelists you have and, and, and to be able to s- support what you guys are doing and be part of it uh, is, is a great uh it's a great honor for me. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. And then when it comes to uh, technical guys, uh, how do you hold on to the technical guys that you don't want them jumping to another race team? You treat them well. Uh, you challenge them because they all want to be challenged. Smart, good guys, they want to be challenged. <clears throat> and, and you give them the tools to do their job. I think if you do those things, by and large, you, you know, people want to stay. People don't, there's an inertia to staying where you are that <clears throat> leaving is difficult. And, you know, you want to make it even harder to leave because you want to give them a great place to work and a great place to be in a place that they feel they can get up in the morning and be challenged. 
uh, to do to do great things. Uh, and you know, we've been lucky. We've been able to you know hang on to and grow our staff. We just uh, we did just lose a, a pivotal member uh, this year. Uh, the great John Ward uh, has decided to to retire, and you know he that guy's done everything you can do in racing, designed uh, race cars, at, uh, some of the Eagles for Dan Gurney, uh, winning programs, championships in IndyCar, in, in IMSA, you name it. Uh, and uh, John, we knew this, we knew this day was coming, but John, John's retired. So uh, I guess we can't, we can't stop uh, father time, <laughs> but, but other than that, uh, you know, keep attracting great people and then retaining them are, that's the lifeblood of any successful race team. I love that. And I love the idea of empowering them, giving them the tools to do their jobs. I think one of the secrets about uh, racing is uh, some of the people who are just great at it would do it for free because they just love the sport. They just want to go driving no matter what. They just want to build a winning race engine no matter what, participate in a winning team, a winning race car. And uh, yeah, and it's part of that people equation as well. And then let's talk about time. I think that's critical for a, a team owner. So um, how do you view the use of time in, in running a race team? Uh, do you hear the clock ticking this all day long? Always, <clears throat> always. You know, we're always working backwards with time, right? Uh, right now, our, our time challenge is uh, the Roar at Daytona. We have new cars. Uh, that are going to be coming into the shop and we've got to prep cars, get ready for, you know, our season just ended just a couple weeks ago at Sebring because of the COVID delays, our season just ended. We got to be ready to be on track with new cars and we're trying to navigate through the holidays and we're, we're trying to very carefully navigate through uh, this COVID resurgence, which is a big, big challenge for, for us right now is keeping especially through the holidays when people want to connect with family and things, keeping all of our team members safe and keeping them uh, COVID free. Because uh, if we start losing people that have to, you know, take time off to recover from this, uh, we don't have a lot of time. We don't, we don't have much of a safety net to have cars ready to go in Daytona. So uh, really that's some of our biggest challenges right now is, is keeping our people safe, keeping them uh, on task, reminding them, that, uh, you know, we all want to spend time around the holidays with family and things, but there's restrictions about what we should and can and, uh, you know, do right now with, with COVID to keep both family members safe, but to keep our team safe too. And those are, those are presenting really, really big challenges. And there's no, there's no guidebook for how to do that. Everybody's trying to find their way through it. Uh, you know, on the IndyCar side, you know, we, we're not on, we don't start our race season until March. And that looks a little different, right? You hope that vaccines and things like that might be available in, in that kind of time frame that will alleviate some of the risks that, that COVID could present. But for us, right, a, a breakout outbreak of COVID within the team could mean having to miss a race. And that's not really an option, right? So um, those are scary. Those are still scary things. And it, it kind of goes hand in hand with time. You know, we're trying to wait out this this pandemic but the race season is going to start again and we can't wait so trying to navigate our way through it while we wait for vaccines and things that will eventually see us hopefully to the end of this mask wearing era that we're in yeah it's a, it's a challenge for everybody I, I uh we all just want it over and uh i feel sorry for everybody some days when it comes to time and planning um <coughs> How far do you look ahead? I mean, are you just looking ahead to the first race? Or are you looking ahead to the first IndyCar race in March? Or if I, if I mention the year 2025, you don't have to tell me anything, but is there kind of a game plan and something in 2025 that you're thinking of accomplishing? Yes. Yes to all of it. You have to have a longer term plan. Uh, and those are some things that we're working on, a three or five year plan. Where, where do you want to be five years from now as a business? Uh, where does Hyundai want to be five years from now in motorsport? Those are all, those are all questions that you need to have answers for uh, because these programs don't pop up, you know, over, over a 60 day period, right? Like it takes a lot of planning. Uh, and especially if you 
move up in higher echelons of motorsport. It takes, it takes time and budget and planning to do all those things. So while we've got our eye on the clock for getting ready for the next race, we also have our, we have to think about strategically uh, how, what do we want to be in two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, and, and create a, a pathway to achieve those things too. So, uh, you know, strategic thinking that, that ends up occupying a lot of my time as a team owner. And I, I wonder, I mean, when you think long-term, is it just Brian in a room by himself or do you have some key people uh, uh, that you can talk to about the year 2025 and brainstorm with them? Uh, you know, sometimes I, I wake up at two in the morning thinking about things sometimes, right? Strategic thinking. So some of it's just me, but I've got business partners uh, that, and, you know, partners like Hyundai that all need to talk through and be part of those, those decisions. So I'm certainly not alone in, in making those kind of uh, decisions or uh, putting those kind of plans in place. And, and it's a small group, right? You don't want to turn it into uh, you know, a, a hundred person committee and not everybody can get an opinion on the big stuff, but uh, you know, you, the, you, you have a small group of, of people who are, who are invested in your program that all need to be part of where you're going and buy in and, and help support that. And then uh, another question is, uh, how do you main the, maintain the kind of consistency of, of a winning race team where the team has to be race ready whenever the green flag drops? So, you know, the thing about this business is that you can't say, I just need 30 more minutes. Let's hold the race off till two o'clock. I'm not ready at 1.30. And, 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 and you have the passion and you have the commitment, but then you have an organization and, and they all have to agree race ready when the green flag drops. Is that hard or do you find you've got the right people and it just works? Uh, it's, it, it, it's a people question again, right? And, you know, we've got, you know, a great team manager and Phil Howard, who's managed IndyCar programs, managed IMSA programs in the past. Uh, you know, we've got a great balance of experience and youth. Uh, we've got a number of, of people on our team that we've hired right out of mechanics that we've hired right out of technical school. We've got engineers that we brought on as interns while they were still in college who are now full-time working for us, race engineering. Uh, but then we also have some very, very experienced guys and, and blending those two things together and, and a lot, again, allowing them to do their job. I find that on a race weekend, you know, I'm, I'll have meetings or, or talk to people and they're always surprised. Oh, you know, do you have time right now? I'm like, yeah, I do. Because when, when it's running correctly, they don't need me in there telling them, Hey, the session's in 30 minutes. Let's make sure that we've got the car off the setup pad. They should know. And they're doing those things. Uh, when I have to get involved, it's bad. It's because something's gone wrong or something's not going the way it should. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, was it the five P's or seven P's prior planning prevents poor performance. Yeah. That's, yeah. that is it in a, in a nutshell and, and having great leadership, uh, you know, allows those things to be in place so that, you know, it shouldn't be a panic. It shouldn't be a surprise. Very good. Uh, I'm learning a lot, Brian. Um, <laughs> the logistics of moving a team around can be daunting and expensive, but like you said, it, it kind of happens. That lunch in the pits is really important. So a, any advice here to team owners, not just at the top level, but even the grassroots level, when it comes to logistics of travel and, and dining and all that? Well, really it comes down to a couple of different things. Um, you, need to, you need to get good people and then take care of the people. That's the best investment you can make. And then really beyond that, uh, trying to stay focused on the things that make the race cars go fast. Uh, you see, it's an allocation of resource and you need to stay at a nice enough hotel, right? There's loads of examples of we've seen teams that run mid pack, you know, and they're staying, you know, their guys are checking out of the Hyatt race morning, right? And then, you know, you don't you don't need to spend all your money on things like that. You need to make sure you have the money to spend on the resources to make your car go fast. But your people are your single greatest resource. So there's a minimum level of expectation that. Uh, you know, we, we, we actually whiffed a couple times this year. So this comes from experience, you know, you, 
you go and you, you book a hotel and you think, hey, this will be fine. And you get there and it, it's not great. Uh, and those are things that you have to be willing to, you know, there's some races we learned this year, we're going to have to spend more on hotels because we need, you know, we need to make sure that our people are safe and <laughs> in, in yeah. good places. So it's, it's, it's an ever evolving process. And I don't know that there's, there's an answer other than you have to have a goal of what you're trying to achieve with all these things. Yeah. I, I've always been happy at a Hampton, Hampton Inn, you know, they, they're, they're clean, they're efficient, uh, they have breakfast in the morning, and uh, I'm good to go there, and, and it doesn't cost the, what the Hyatt does. Well, you know, the one thing I do is I always stay where the team stays, wherever it is. I stay with the team, uh, and if I'm at a hotel, I'm at the team hotel, and the reason is because I, I, I want to very clearly send the message, right? I wouldn't ask you to do something I wouldn't do myself, and that's the same thing on a race weekend, uh, you know, I'll often, you know, straighten the chairs up in our little lounge area or wipe a table down. And it's not that they're not doing it, but I want to demonstrate through example that, you know, I'm willing, these things are important to me, right? And that I'm willing to do them too. So again, I'm not asking, there's no job that's beneath me. So there's no job that's beneath anybody on the team. Okay. I like that part too. And then let's talk about getting sponsorship. What have you found to be the key elements in building a successful sponsorship program? I, I just picture it as a job that's never over. Never over, never over. You're right. Um, but it's, it's one of the three key pillars, right? People, yeah. time, money. And I can't manufacture time, right? So really the two that I can control are people and money. And if you have great people and you give them the financial resources. And so that's the hardest part. And, you know, every successful program has those elements. And we're very fortunate with the IMSA program, have great partnerships uh, from Hyundai. And we're, we're very fortunate uh, with Andretti Autosport and the IndyCar side, to have great financial partners. And those things uh, don't happen by accident. They're cultivated, they're built over time. Uh, and, and it's not, it's so much beyond the communication of how big is the decal going to be on the race car, right? If that's the conversation you're having, you're really not having the right conversation at all. Uh, it's about understanding the needs of the partners and trying to create uh, ways to leverage motorsport to address those needs. And that's, that's true in every single successful race program I've ever been involved in. And I think that's, that's true in our race program as well is, you know, understanding the needs of the, of the people who are financially contributing to help you go out and do these things and making sure that you're doing a damn good job for them and always over delivering for them. Yeah. I, I just think you've approached the task like I would is that you have to walk into those sponsorship meetings with something to offer them. It's not the reverse. Like you should give us money. You have to be careful how you do it. Uh, you know, I, I got some really good advice in these pitch meetings and things. And it was, if you're not listening more than you're talking, you're doing it wrong. Okay. Again, that was worth the price of attending online race industry week. Uh, in the Indy 500, are you making the calls yourself when it comes to the pits and, and when to pit and get more fuel and those kind of decisions? Uh, is that you, Brian, doing, doing that on your team? Well, in terms of uh, the role of race strategist during the races, yes and no. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the one on the radio. I'm the one that's relaying those messages back to the driver. Uh, again, it's a team. I've got a great team of people on the on, on our engineering stand that you know includes a race engineer, uh, assistant engineer, and we've got five or six of us that are looking at data, watching the race, evaluating, and we talk. We have we have an interactive conversation uh, about would we pit right now? What if it's yellow? What if it's this? And so it's, it's an always changing, evolving process, but ultimately somebody has to make the call. So ultimately that, right, in, on our time you stand, that does end up being me because you can't always just build consens consensus. And there's some times where something happens very quickly, right? And there's a, a car goes off in the tires and you're, you know, 15 seconds away from the pit entrance and you got to make a decision could we beat this yellow if we pit right now and you got to make a call, you don't have time to talk about it. 
So uh, you do, I've got great smart people. I'd be foolish not to uh, rely on those smart people to help me make those decisions. Uh, but ultimately, right, somebody's got to, somebody's got to make the final decision. And that can't be a committee thing. Well, you're particularly brilliant with uh, Rossi's win. I mean, that, that was a real uh, big decision about fuel saving, right? It was, but it wasn't a hard decision because we'd had two really bad pit stops early on that put us in the back. And it was pretty clear that we had a car capable of winning and a driver capable of winning, but we didn't have the track position. And so it was a very simple question, right? How can we get ourselves track position? And with a 500 mile race, you've got enough time that for things to play out. And so the question was, what if we made one last pit stop? And it really all stemmed from that. But we never would have asked that question if we hadn't had the two bad pit stops, right? If we, if, and even though we did win on a fuel strategy, I always like to point out, we also had the fastest lap of the race with Alexander Rossi. So we had a very fast race car and that shouldn't be lost in the fact that we won it on a fuel strategy. Uh, we also won it with arguably one of the best cars and a rookie driver who did an amazing job to execute a strategy that, uh, you know, the fuel number and the pace we were asking him to hit would have been difficult for any driver out there to do. So uh, it was it was fun to be a part of it. It was especially fun because it worked. Uh, you know, it, we, we could have done the exact same thing in one yellow at the wrong time and, and nobody would have noticed and it would have just been a failed attempt, but because it worked uh, and because I think it took a lot longer for a uh, commentary crew, for people to realize what we were doing. You know, we, we knew what we were doing for a oh, hundred and something laps of the race, right? It was all building over a hundred and something laps, but it was really only the last 15 or 20 laps that it came to light that, oh my gosh, they might actually make it. They may not run out of fuel. Uh, that it became such a dramatic thing. Uh, so that was fun. It, it's one of the only races I've gone back and actually watched the race. I don't typically watch our races afterwards, but I watched that one and it, it was fun for me. It's kind of like a, watching it. Like a, I've got a secret through most of the race. Like I knew, I knew, but um, it, it was fun to see how it played out. I, I, I wish they would have connected you to a heart monitor. We, we could just watch your heartbeat uh, th throughout all that. <clears throat> Didn't change a lot. You know, oh, I, I, I don't, I, I tend to, I, I think that's a holdover from, from my time racing is you do, you, you tend to learn to manage emotion. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of trepidation or right? it was either going to work or it wasn't, but the focus was on making it work. There wasn't a lot of anxiety. We had already, the ship had sailed. There wasn't, there was no backing out of what we were doing. There was no, right. So there wasn't a lot of anxiety and it wasn't clear at the time it was going to work. It was just our best shot. It was the thing that gave us a chance to win. So uh, I, I don't generally feel a lot of anxiety or nervousness during races. Um, I, I get more nervous watching Colton race than I do calling the strategy or, or anything like that. I, I enjoy that part of it. <clears throat> and I also understand that there's things that are in your control and there's things that are out of your control and things out of your control can change and make you, they can make you right, which is kind of how it worked in this case, but they can also make you wrong. And, and trust me, I've been wrong plenty of days too. Um, you know, but luckily we were right on a day that it really mattered a lot. Yep. That's awesome. And then let's talk about Colton. A lot of people watching, uh, a lot of people in the racing industry, you know, they, they have their position with the company in the racing industry, but then they're also have, have a, a son or a daughter that has kind of interest in going racing and they help them uh, and, and hope that they become uh, successful as a race car driver. And that's a long path, a long journey. <laughs> um, so it's just how, how do you raise a racer like Colton? What, what, was, what was the magic there? I don't know. Some of it, some of it is right. You either have it or you don't part of it. You're born with, uh, you know, there's certainly an element to it that you can't teach somebody. And, you know, again, 
putting him around the right people, even going back to when we were in karting, you know, putting people around him that he could learn from and could, could teach him. I get a lot of credit for teaching him. I did a lot less teaching of him than people would think. Uh, and I, I see this to this day, um, even with Michael Andretti, uh, you know, with, with Marco, it is hard to teach your son or daughter. It's just the dynamic of parent child is it always enters into it. So I've tried to put him around great people. And frankly, when he was 13, he moved to Europe on his own. Uh, I wasn't there and I put him at Carlin, which has a tremendous academy program and a great history. And they, they did more formative training on him than anybody else. And he came back from Europe after a couple of years with Carlin and he was a monster and, and, you know, he's done great things. And I, I've, I get great enjoyment, tremendous enjoyment. And any parent would understand that watching your child succeed, uh, watching him race. Uh, but I deserve far less credit than some people have tried to give me for it. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough sport. It's a cruel sport. And, and to have your child enter it, this, I can imagine the trepidation, like, oh, I, good luck. And uh, Michael Lewis went to Europe, too. And I, and I saw that transformation that you can have going to Europe. And uh, they, they really drill you differently, train you differently. And, uh, boy, they, they can take you to the next level. Well, and there's there's great training programs, and you know there's there's great programs here too. Uh, frankly, I think Colton went to Europe to get away from me in a way. That's uh, classic. He started racing here, and, and and he was getting a lot of attention for being my son, racing junior formula, and probably less attention for starting to you know learn and have success at it. And I think. You know, the last thing his mother and I wanted was for our, you know, early teenage child to move away. And he didn't live here. He didn't know anybody. It was, it was hard. It was a hardship on him. It was a hardship on us. I think, you know, we both cried a lot on the plane ride home from England. You know, we flew him to England, met the family he was going to live with. We stayed there two days and left him there. Uh, and I know my wife cried most of the flight home. And I, I, if I'm honest, I probably did a little bit too. Sure, sure. But it was the sacrifice uh, and the discipline that it took to do that, that I think it, at a very formative time for him made a difference, right? If you're, if you're willing to do that, you're willing to do anything to try and win. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's a great, great champions all have that. Um, they all have that attribute. They're willing to sacrifice they're willing to put uh, put this above many other things in their life, and it, it's a it's a hard thing, right? Because there's a lot at a time when a lot of guys would rather be, you know, chasing girls or 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 hanging out with their buddies. You have to decide I'm going to do this instead and hope that it's worth it. And that that's the damn truth of things. And and thank you for putting it so well and, and sharing something personal. Uh, we're kind of at past the 50 minute mark, Brian. So uh, we're just going to wrap this up. I, I sure have enjoyed this. I could talk to you for another hour or two. And, and, and I learned a few nuggets of information that I, I really wasn't quite aware of uh, about the role of a team owner and how to handle that task. So th thank you so much, Brian, for being part of this. It was great talking with you. Hey, I appreciate it. I, I just want <clears throat> to say too, that uh, since, since you guys were great enough to have me on it, you know, I, I, been a fan of what you guys do. We utilize epartrade.com with our with our team. We've found suppliers through you guys. We've in, we've been reached out to by suppliers through you guys. So uh, I think it's a really valuable thing, not just for us, but for any motorsport team. And and appreciate you guys for having the vision to do it and uh, and to push it through because it's hard to be the first at anything. And you guys are definitely leading the way here. Yeah, well, you. you know, racers, it, it, being the first is okay. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, thanks so much, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you Thank very, you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Registering on ePartrade is easy. Fill out your name, email, phone number, and create a secure password. Next, select your business type. 
Choose supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose racing business if you're looking to find new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose race team if you own or are a member of a professional racing team. Begin typing your company name. We most likely already have your company in our database, which you can select from the drop-down. Then, enter your job title. Choose Claim Company if you'll be editing your company profile. Other members of your company can choose Join Company if they'd like to use ePartrade as well. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. You'll need to confirm your email once it goes through. To keep our platform industry only, you'll be approved shortly after. If we require additional proof of business, we'll reach out. Welcome to ePartrade.